Hello everyone. I hope you had a good exam and you really marked all the questions well. Well, my best of luck for your result. Now in anesthesia, I got total five questions. All five were very predictable, very simple question. So straight away, without wasting any time, let us come to the question. The first question which was asked, which was given to me is based on recall. And the question is road traffic accident with severe maxillofacial trauma, airway management. Well, it's an acute condition, road traffic accident, acute injury, and patient had a severe maxillofacial trauma, immediate airway management. If it's emergency airway management just after accident, or irrespective of the type of injury, whether it's maxillofacial, whether it's cervical spine injury or anything, we go for orotracheal intubation because that's the fastest way to secure the airway in these conditions. But if the question was asked, that in maxillofacial injury patient who requires a uh, old maxillofacial injury patient who requires intubation that is electively we have to intubate not emergency intubation then what is best for that injury we would do that airway management and for maxillofacial the answer had to be tracheostomy so i exactly don't know what was the language of the question exact language of the question but what i got is the road traffic accident with severe maxillofacial injury immediately came to hospital and what is the emergency airway management so thinking this as the question i'm going for orotracheal intubation as the answer so as i explained you in my topic airway management that in emergency in emergency irrespective irrespective of type of injury type of injury what we do we do orotracheal intubation so we do orotracheal intubation always whether it is cervical spine injury or maxillofacial injury or any other injury but if it is elective elective airway management so elective airway management we do what is best for that patient and in elective airway management for cervical spine for example for cervical spine injury we would answer nasotracheal intubation nasotracheal intubation right and for your maxillofacial elective management maxillofacial we would go for answer tracheostomy tracheostomy got my point so here thinking the question was asked in acute scenario i am answering orotracheal intubation okay now next question which of the following agent has blood gas partition coefficient similar to nitrous oxide well i told you so many times you have to remember the sequence what was the sequence sequence from the latest gas which came into clinical practice to the oldest gas right so desflurane is the latest one which came in the clinical practice then sevoflurane i will mean, not making this arrow sevoflurane the next gas then isoflurane came before sevo and then first one which came was halothane halothane i told you to remember the sequence and i told you for blood gas solubility blood gas solubility right desflurane has the lowest blood gas solubility then sevo then iso and then halothane and blood gas solubility tell us about speed of induction speed of induction right and when i added the blood gas solubility of the carrier gas in it i added the blood gas solubility of nitrous oxide and xenon and I told you that xenon has the lowest blood gas solubility and nitrous oxide and xenon is more or less equal. Nitrous oxide, the blood gas solubility is 0.45. Desflurane, the blood gas solubility is 0.42. Sevoflurane, it is 0.63. Isoflurane, it is 1.2. And halothane, it is 2.25. Xenon, it is 0.11 lowest blood gas solubility so which agent has the blood gas solubility near to nitrous oxide definitely the answer has to be desflurane so answer for my this question is desflurane so very easy question i know for most of my students because we have discussed this sequence so many times and the sequence is just opposite for the mac 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 the lowest mac is of halothane so halothane is most potent so the sequence for mac is just opposite halothane has the lowest mark mac right halothane has the lowest mac then isoflurane then sevoflurane and then desflurane right so that is why halothane is most potent it is le least required to produce the effect so halothane is most potent and nitrous oxide 
the carrier gas has a higher mark than desflurane. Now, desflurane has a mark of 6, nitrous oxide has a mark of 104. And xenon is in between nitrous oxide and desflurane. It's a carrier gas. Xenon, it has a mark of 70, but it is much higher than our potent inhalational anesthetic agents, right? 6 is of desflurane, 2 is for sevoflurane, 1.3 is for iso, and 0 0.75 is for halothane. Okay, so remember this. Okay, very simple question. Next question. Again, a very expected question. A patient was given 0.5% bipovacaine for supraclavicular brachial plexus block and suddenly developed hypotension and arrhythmia. Now, patient was given the block and by block, for block, he was given local anesthetic and developed the cardiovascular symptoms. Well, what we will suspect? We will suspect the drug which was given locally for the block has resulted in systemic absorption and this is local anesthetic systemic toxicity. So, I have talked so many times about this last local anesthetic systemic toxicity, the CNS symptom and CVS symptom. And I have so many times told you that bupivacaine is most cardiotoxic, is most cardiotoxic. It binds to the sodium channel of heart very rigidly. So, it is most Mostly when we give bupivacaine, the risk of cardiovascular toxicity is highest. And what are the clinical features of cardiovascular toxicity? Well, hypotension is one of the first clinical feature. Then definitely arrhythmias can happen because of the blockage of the sodium channel, which the local anesthetic do. And the patient can go into cardiac arrest as well. Okay. So, and obviously, what is the CNS symptom? We have talked so many times. Apprehension. Apprehension numbness, perioral numbness, twitches, and seizure, seizures, okay. So, this patient directly hypotension and arrhythmia was noted. This is definitely cardiovascular symptoms of local anesthetic systemic toxicity. What's the management? Well, management for local anesthetic systemic toxicity, immediate management, do not give any further local anesthetic to the patient. Stop the in injection of the drug immediately. If you are still injecting it, call for help then manage whatever symptom is coming, manage symptomatically whatever symptom is coming. If it's cardiac arrest, we do CPCR. If it's arrhythmia, we give antiarrhythmic agent. If it's hypotension, we give, we start inotropes. And guys, the rescue drug for local anesthetic systemic toxicity is 20% intralipid emulsion. We start the infusion of 20% intralipid emulsion, very important. This will do two things. It absorbs bupivacaine, what is present in the blood, the remaining bupivacaine, and it will also let the bupivacaine, which is attached to the sodium channel of the heart, diffuse out, and it will again absorb that also. The lipid escape of local anesthetic, we have talked so many times about. So, this is kind of rescue therapy in case of last. The dose of in 20% intralipid emulsion is for 70 kg, for less than 70 kg, 1.5 ml per kg body weight. For more than 70 kg, the bolus. 100 ml is given of 20% intralipid emulsion. So, what's the answer for this question? Patient still having hypotension arrhythmia and option could be uh, invasive ventilation. Patient is not unconscious. Patient is not on, I mean, I have not intubated the patient. So, invasive ventilation is not an option at present. Intralipid emulsion, well, this is the drug of choice, the rescue drug. So, the bicarb, well, it can we, we will uh, see if the soda bicarb is required or not later on. But at present, patient is not in cardiac arrest and we there is no acidosis reported in the clinical features of the patient. So, no role of sodium, bi sodium bi soda bicarbonate. CPR. Until an illness patient goes into cardiac arrest, CPR is not required. So, CPR would not be the answer. It's just hypotension and arrhythmia, intralipid emulsion, right? This would be the answer. Very simple question. I told you last, see last, go for intralipid emulsion as the answer. Okay, next question. Which out of the given option, which layer does not get punctured, punctured when for epidural anesthesia? So, for epidural anesthesia, which is not punctured. So, this is the spinal cord, this is the pia mater, this is the arconoid mater, and this is the dura mater. Just out, outside dura mater is ligamentum flavum. Then your spines, these are the spines. In between the spines, we have interspinous ligament. And outside this, just on the surface of the spine is supraspinous ligament. And then we have the subcutaneous fossa. And then we have the outermost layer, skin. 
So this is skin, this is subcutaneous fossa, this is supraspinous ligament, supraspinous ligament, this is interspinous ligament, this is ligamentum flavum, this is the dura matter, this is the arconoid matter, this is the pia matter. So for epidural, we have to remain outside the dura matter. So when we pierce the ligamentum flavum, ligamentum flavum, we enter the epidural space, right? For your spinal anesthesia, you need to pierce the dura matter and arconoid matter and then enter the subarachnoid space. So for epidural, which layer is not punctured? The answer is your arconoid matter. This would be the answer, right? Ligamentum flavum is the last layer to be punctured for epidural anesthesia. So many times this question has been asked. Supraspinatus ligament and interspinous, interspinous ligament is outside the ligamentum flavum, okay? So answer has to be your your arconoid matter, right? Now, because answer in the question, it is not getting punctured, right? Now, coming on the last question, the fifth question, contraindication of use of BiPAP, that is bi-level positive airway pressure, right? Which comes under our non-invasive ventilation, non-invasive ventilation. Now, I have told you so many times in my topic the ventilation right that for non-invasive ventilation we need the patient to fulfill two criteria number one the patient has to be conscious and oriented and number two patient can protect his airway if both are not there what will happen patient will aspirate what do i mean by non-invasive ventilation we are ventilating supporting the breathing of the patient with a mask what do i mean by invasive ventilation we have put the endotracheal tube so when I am supporting the patient's ventilation with a mask, patient can cough in the mask. If patient can cough, it's okay, he can protect his airway. If patient will vomit and he doesn't, cannot protect his airway, the, all the secretions and the vomitus will go into the respiratory tract. Patient will aspirate. Patient is unconscious, he cannot protect his airway. Patient will aspirate. So most important prerequisite for non-invasive ventilation is the patient should be conscious. So contraindication to the use of BiPAP is unconscious patient. A very interesting question. So many times we have discussed this also. I have told you about BiPAP. I was expecting the question from non-invasive ventilation because invasive ventilation was recently very commonly being asked. So all the five questions is our questions which I know most of my students have must have answered correctly. So all, of the, all the best for your result, right? I hope you have marked all the questions correct. Thank you.